Thank you so much, Omar, um, for the invitation and um, the generous, generous introduction. And um, people who know me know that I cringe at introductions, mainly because um, it's really difficult for me to uh, be reflective about myself. And so when I have to listen to what I've done, it forces some reflection, which I hate. So, <laughs> but um, thank you all for being here this evening. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit about um, abolition tonight and to talk about organizing and talk about creativity and also talk about art, um, which I love to kind of, um, you know, I'm a I'm an appreciator of art. I'm not an artist myself, but um, I really, really appreciate art and also appreciate that um, uh, social movements and social movement work for me is a form of collective art making. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in my remarks tonight as well. So thank you. Also want to thank um, Erica for being here. And first of all, people who know me also know that I do not know how to make PowerPoint. So Erica and Garen um, really helped me out. And Erica's here with the slides today uh, to help out as well. So going to jump in. Um, I'm an educator and an organizer, as you heard. I came to Prison Industrial Complex, or PIC, Abolition and Transformative Justice, through my work to end racialized and gender-based violence in particular. I realized that prison, in fact, normalizes and reproduces violence rather than ending it. So if I considered myself to be an anti-violence organizer, then I couldn't very well support the existence of prisons and policing. My longstanding and ongoing project as an organizer has been focused on ending racialized and gendered systems of violence organized through the prison industrial complex, which includes prisons, policing, and surveillance. I started organizing to uproot racialized violence when I was still a teenager living in New York City. And I've been specifically organizing to dismantle the prison industrial complex while simultaneously increasing the ability of those communities targeted by it to be stronger, healthier, and more self-determined for over two decades. I'm a PAC abolitionist in its simplest terms because I want to dismantle a system predicated on premature death. And as Ruthie Gilmore teaches us on organized abandonment, and instead to build one um, in terms of a system that is focused on life and on true safety. So my work is grounded in a few questions. And I always begin with questions because I believe that good questions are key to encouraging exploration and exploration is key to thinking about or thinking through otherwise worlds as my friend Ashan Crowley would say, asking good questions does not necessarily mean that our responses will be good ones, but they really do improve our chances. The questions that I've been thinking about and wrestling with for the past two decades are, how did the US become the world's largest jailer? Um, how can we address inevitable harms without punishment? What is a just system for adjudicating and evaluating harms? How do we transform human relationships so that we can envision and then create a just world? What are the ruptures and breaks that allow us to prefigure another way of living? And how do we ensure that everyone on the planet has enough? Today's talk focuses on the fifth question. What are the ruptures and breaks that allow us to prefigure another way of living? So as conceptualized by sociologist Thomas Matheson, abolition is an alternative in the making. It really pushes us to break with the current order to say, not this, while simultaneously forging new ground, 
building a different world. PIC abolition is a vision of a restructured society and world, a world where we have everything that we need, food, shelter, education, health, art, beauty, clean water, and much more. Eric Stanley writes that abolition is not simply a reaction to the prison industrial complex, but a political commitment that makes the PIC impossible. So this means that our work is to create a world where prisons, policing, and surveillance are not normalized facets of our society anymore. So I'm gonna ask you all for a minute, wherever you are, to try to ground yourself for a second. Put your feet down on the ground if you can, or somewhere where you're kind of situating yourself. And I want you to close your eyes for just a minute and I want us to imagine together. In a post-prison, post-policing, post-surveillance world, how will we get along together? How are conflicts resolved in that world? How are decisions made? What technologies are we using? How are resources distributed? I want you to think about those questions just for a second and kind of dare to think about those questions, the answers to those questions being different than what you would imagine. We can ask a million different questions and really we should, we should always be questioning. My life's work is really to push people to first imagine a world without prisons, policing and surveillance, and then to organize to make that a reality. Towards that end, I spend a lot of time thinking about the future and about the fact that it exists in our imaginations. Donna Markova calls the future a collective story waiting for our voices to express. I've always appreciated that description. The future is also, as Howard Zinn teaches us, an infinite succession of presence. And this suggests that our current voices and dreams and actions are what will build the future. Tiffany Lenoy, who is a healer in New York City, says that abolition is nonlinear. That's why we're able to be changing the present while living in the future now. I love that as an idea, the living in the future now part. The future and imagination are important to me because the horizon that I'm working towards is one I have never seen. That horizon is a world without policing, imprisonment or surveillance. As my friend writer, artist and scholar, Eve Ewing says, in order to create pathways towards that which we have never seen, we have to lead with imagination. Poet Martina Spada tells us that no change for the good ever happens without it being imagined first, even if that change seems hopeless or impossible in the present. All of the most important and impactful social transformations happened because people fought and struggled for things they had never seen. As a prison industrial complex abolitionist, I am always trying to prefigure the world in which I want to live. I try to practice abolition every day towards that end. This involves both organizing for the destruction of the death-making institutions that exist in this world and for the creation of life-giving and affirming ones. In this collective abolitionist project, we really don't know if we're going to win, but in the words of Jayesh Bai, who I learned about through my comrade, Sonia Shah, we're trying to act with the urgency of tomorrow and also with the patience of 1,000 years. 
So just a reminder to all of us that this is a long-term project that we're engaged in as abolitionists. As my friend and fellow abolitionist, Dr. Erica Miners has written, liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. And this is why I think it's so important to cultivate imagination because oppression has a really awful way of putting a ceiling on our imaginations. Artist and filmmaker Chris Vargas talks about the fact that one of the most destructive aspects of the PIC is that it creates occupied imaginations. I think about that all the time, all of our occupied imaginations. And so we need to consistently grasp for ways to unleash our imaginations in the face of oppression. Abolitionist art can be a way for us to do just this. Here are a few lines from Kyle Lopez's recent poem, After Abolition. A prison is the far off past of a structure turned free housing, each cell wall knocked to sandcastle ruin, halls reshaped and redyed in green paints, former floor plans carved out like shores into spacious homes, laundry and AC a given in each. Here are a few lines from one of my favorite poems um, abolitionist poems uh, by Franny Choi called Field Trip to the Museum of Human History. Ancient American society was built on competition and maintained through domination and control. In place of modern day accountability practices, the institution known as police kept order using intimidation, punishment, and force. We pressed our noses to the glass, strained to imagine strangers running into our homes, pointing guns in our faces because we'd hoarded too much of the wrong kind of property. In her poem, Franny reminds us that someone invented police and prisons. While she simultaneously forces us to imagine these institutions as relics of a violent and oppressive past. If the PIC could be invented, so too can we imagine a world that would operate without it. Surely we can. And more than that, we can prefigure the world in which we wanna live. We can practice abolition daily, for example, through creating community-based efforts to address harm, as imperfect as those often are. Every time we deal with harm without involving police and prisons, we are building towards a possible abolitionist horizon. Abolition centers harms, not crimes, and it centers relationships. As such, abolition necessarily means that our social relationships will have to be transformed. We need to practice those social relations now. And there are countless experiments and projects across the country and the world doing just that. Abolition teaches us that the experience of committing harm and the experience of surviving harm advance concurrently. And this is beautifully underscored in the following short video about a mother's circle run by sister Donna Liette, someone I respect deeply who works at a place called Precious Blood Ministries of Reconciliation in back of the yards in Chicago. So we're gonna take a minute, a few couple minutes and we're gonna watch and listen to that video. Hello. It's a 
wonderful. We have a little circle sort of, but actually much bigger than I expected with the snow out there. So I didn't expect many people to come at all, or many mothers, women. So it's good. So let's just take a moment to kind of concentrate on our candle and just the presence of God. One of the primary things that we do is to work with youth, uh, boys uh, 14 to 24, and try to prevent violence and gang life. And so I had gone to the juvenile detention center, uh, and as I would talk to the boys, they'd say, will you call my mother? So I started calling the mothers. So we meet once a month, and um, we gather, and we have a real nice brunch for them, because no one really honors these women whose children are incarcerated because they think they're bad mothers. And also the mothers sometimes isolate because they feel shame, they feel fear. I went to the mother circle because in 2011, I lost my one and only son, um, Anthony L. Brown Jr. to gun violence. I did not know the dynamics of the mother circle. In the circle, you know, you, you kind of like sharing your stories. You go around one by one holding a talking piece and you're telling your stories. And so as we're going around, I'm listening to all these mom stories. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm in the wrong circle because I'm hearing stories of mothers who have children that are incarcerated for actually murdering somebody. I'm not one that has lost any of my children through violence. Uh, but, I, but I had a daughter that was a perpetrator of violence. So one of my biggest fears when I would get those two or three o'clock morning calls was that she either got killed or killed somebody. We all have the same issues, but we may have a different story on how we got there. In that circle, I think we all was able to help each other to get to a place of, of healing because at the end of the day, we all had a loss. And that's what I had discovered from that circle. And I think many of those other women had discovered as well. Why I come is just um, to provide a space and just to be with women who have such powerful stories, such rich souls. You're rich in your soul. Your stories really need to be told and beyond. Those of you who have lost children to violence, you have lost children to incarceration. You're very, very special women. You're good women and you're hurting women. And we have a challenge as a community to help you through that. You know, I I think about that work because I've been involved in doing kind of circle keeping. Um, I got my start in kind of engaging in restorative justice work in the mid 90s um, and uh, moved on to doing more focus on transformative justice work. But as my friend Danielle Sarad says, no one's entry point into violence is committing it. And I think we should be thinking about that all the time, especially as abolitionists. What does that mean for abolitionist work? It means that we have to encourage healing justice in our practice and in our lives. Um, if as Sadia Hartman teaches us, care is an antidote to violence, then a politics of care really does have to be central to our abolitionist organizing. And you know, that's not an uncontroversial thing to say because people have a lot of critiques about care, blah, blah, blah. My, my bottom line is that a practice of abolitionist care is what underscores that our fates are intertwined, that our liberation is interconnected. And I think that the mother's circle is a beautiful example of this and I know that this isn't just happening in the mother's circle, this is happening in so many places. 
all the time, everywhere in the world. Alexis Pauline Gum's essay, Freedom Seeds, has been a source of inspiration in my work. And in it, she writes, what if abolition isn't a shattering thing, not a crashing thing, not a wrecking ball event? What if abolition is something that sprouts out of the wet places in our eyes, the broken places in our skin, the waiting places in our palms, the tremble holding in my mouth when I turn to you? What if abolition is something that grows? What if abolishing the prison industrial complex is the fruit of our diligent gardening, building and deepening of our movement to respond to the violence of the state and the violence of our communities with sustainable and transformative love. And for me, I would say instead of love with sustainable and transformative care. And you know, not all abolitionists are um, kind of root abolition for them in a transformative justice framework. We have all different kinds of abolitionists. And I think maybe that's something more people will write about or think about or talk about um, as we keep deepening and growing the movements. But my abolition is very much rooted in transformative justice. Um, and at the root of transformative justice is the notion of transformative care. And so if we transform human relationships so that we can envision and then create a more just world, what could we grow instead of punishment and suffering? We need imagination to create our responses. I often think about another question for me all the time is whether our culture currently cultivates that imagination that we need. I hope you all sit with that question too and ask yourselves, if it doesn't, why? Why does it not? And then I think about Krista Franklin, who's one of my favorite poets and artists, who offers us our marching orders. Krista writes, if you find your imagination cannot stop itself from churning out the scripts of the death machines, pull its plug, dismantle it, reprogram it, dream daylight, manufacture daylight. We are the magicians, make magic. Part of our work as abolitionists is to do that, is to make sure that the scripts of the death machines are reprogrammed and dis dismantled and that we dream something else and that we manufacture and build something else. Turning again to E. Ewing's words, we must do the expansive imaginative work of trying to conceive something else. For me, that something else is an abolitionist present and future. When we embrace an abolitionist politic and vision, we want something radically different. We imagine a future that does not include these death-making institutions. We actively practice addressing harms in ways that would facilitate this vision. We organize, we build, we organized. On August 14, 2019, LA community celebrated a victory won by incredible community organizing by groups like Critical Resistance Los Angeles, the Justice LA Coalition, and many more. After years of community pressure, against a multi-billion dollar jail expansion plan, the LA County Board of Supervisors voted four to one to end plans for the construction of a new so-called mental health jail. Echoing community demands of care, not cages, the supervisors also voted to explore building a decentralized community-based system of care across LA. Supervisor Sheila Cool said, incarceration itself, sorry, incarceration is itself an experiment and it's an experiment that has failed. To me, that's realism, that's being real, facing up to the fact that jails don't increase public safety. I love um, after the campaign, they, they were successful in, in their push. And again, this is a multi-year campaign. 
you know, built with hundreds and hundreds of people over time. Um, they put out a very short video that I'd love to have Erica show us um, at this point. This fight is not, not a political fight. This fight is about our siblings. It's about our fathers, our sisters, our wives, our girlfriends, our boyfriends. Incarceration and state violence never did and never will heal anything. The county that has for so long been the leader in all of these dubious things can now potentially shift and be the leader in a vision that's about care, that's about community. We don't belong in cages. We belong in our society, supported to become who are, we are destined to be. The nation is looking and they will follow what happens here. So it's important, we have a huge responsibility. Yes, we can. See the So it looks like incarceration is new Jim Crow, and it's about time that we end that and we look towards community care. I think we need to reallocate some of the funds back to our community so our kids can be back involved in sports after school programs. Sorry, I'm not sure what these you're programs are not here no more. The sheriff purports to support public safety when in fact they are the ones that are harming our communities. If we want public safety, we need to remove them from the equation. We have had a paradigm shift on this board of supervisors. It became clear to us that we could not create this model within the confines of this contract. Incarceration is itself an experiment, and it's an experiment in this field. Supervisors, please, I. So I think we're having trouble with the video and buffering. So this fight is not a political fight. This so we're just going to keep it moving. Um, needless to say, you would just see people celebrating their win. Um, so we can, yeah, we'll just keep it moving on that point. Um, so basically, you know, the organizers are going to continue to fight because they have to now ensure that the county follows through on resourcing decentralized community care and that those resources sources truly reflect the communities who are directly impacted by the prison industrial complex. In addition to resources such as care, voluntary treatment, and housing, LA County has to truly prioritize eliminating pre-child jailing, decriminalizing quality of life charges, and ending the onslaught of policing on LA's communities of color and unhoused people. What we need in this current moment really is to reshape and redefine our vision of what justice means. We can't settle for tinkering around the edges or for reforms that actually strengthen policing, prisons and surveillance. We can't advance reforms that produce more violence. We can't settle for individual indictments that are mostly symbolic or for body cameras on police that are more likely to be turned on the public than the cops. We have to restructure the ways that we interact with each other in order to make the police obsolete. Importantly, we have to abolish capitalism if we're really gonna be successful at ending prisons and police as institutions, since police and prisons and capitalism are in a dialectical relationship. I am more convinced than ever that ending the PIC, including policing, provides us with the best opportunity for broad-based broad movement building in this current moment. And that's because the PIC encompasses and is created by multiple isms. This means that the movement that we build and our resistance 
will need to be truly intersectional if we are to be successful in abolishing the PIC. To abolish capitalism, patriarchy, heterosexism, transphobia, and white supremacy, we must work to end the PIC. To get at the roots of the PIC, we must take on the broader system that produces the logic of keeping millions of people in cages and of the police state itself. We don't know what will happen and that's okay. Certainty is not required as we organize towards abolition, but I believe that imagination is. We hold fast to possibility over certainty. This is not or it was not a talk about the answers. It is one rooted in possibility and imagination. It is one interested in pushing us to ask better questions. I think we know what to do. We just need more people doing it and we need to be more strategic. The work of abolition insists that we foreground those behind the walls, that we listen to them, take their ideas seriously and take leadership from them. It means that we have to address surveillance and policing, that we need racial, economic and gender and environmental justice and that we need to transform the relationships we have to each other so that we can create new forms of safety and justice in our communities. In other words, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore teaches us, abolition necessitates that we change everything. And to do that, we have to build huge social movements and not clubs. Social movements are a form, as I mentioned before, of collective art making. And abolition lends itself to movement building because it is a project of building and making and constantly iterating ideas and using our imaginations all the time. It is both a vision and a practice. While reform requires us to really affirm the current system and surrender our imagination to the carceral state, abolition encourages dreaming and challenges us to use our best thinking to build a better society. Policing actually, because they were in the moment of defund police and everybody seems to be wanting to talk about it, but not really about it, talk around it or talk from their particular positionality. Policing rather than a modern civilized institution committed to law and order and evolving over time to me and many others has been exposed as an ongoing settler colonial project organized through terror, violence and control through a series of race and gender strategies that include the policing of prisoners, the policing of the US-Mexico border, torture and much more. So what can freedom making look like in the shadow of policing? Can we chip away at the legitimacy of policing? Can we help people imagine the end of policing? To me, that's what we're all fighting for in this moment. Sometimes in organizing, we can get stuck by focusing exclusively on what people are supposedly quote unquote ready for. PIC abolition rooted in collective art making allows us to accompany people as they explore what they truly long for using their imaginations. We gotta start, stop saying that people are quote, only ready for so much. How do you know? You don't, that's the bottom line. In this current moment, we are inviting the public to come along with us as we defund the police. In partnership with Blue Seat Studios, we at Project NIA recently created a short defund the police video that I would love it if Erica can show. Let's watch it together. People have a lot of opinions about policing and our ideas about policing are shaped by our race, our genders, our class, and our parents. For example, most white people have very little interaction with police in a recent study, 77% of white people had no contact with police in the previous year. Of those who did, at least half were traffic stops. And in many cases, 
white people initiated contact by calling the police. Since they have little unwanted contact, many white people's opinions about policing are not based on personal experience. Dominant culture, especially mass media, sells us the image of officer-friendly, but whose experience is that actually based on? The same study found that Black people experience excessive force at the hands of police at more than twice the rate of white people. Did we have a just and equitable police force and something went wrong? No. Policing in the South emerged from the slave patrols in the 17 and 1800s that caught and returned runaway enslaved people. In the West, police departments were formed to keep native people out of cities built by white settlers. And in the North, the first municipal police departments in the mid 1800s helped quash labor strikes and riots against the rich and policed public spaces to conform to middle-class white morality around gender and sexuality and exclude poor, unhoused, or disabled people. Policing in the U.S. began as a system of economic, social, racial, patriarchal, and ableist control. And that is what it still is today. The truth is police don't do what most people think they do. Police spend more than half of their time responding to non-criminal calls and traffic issues, and only one to 3% of their time responding to violent crime calls. Police don't stop violence. They respond to violence that has already occurred, and they respond with their own threat of violence. And that response is not equitable. When people of color are involved, police often engage violently. Yet, we spent an astronomical amount of money on the police. Over $100 billion a year. Let that sink in. The demand to defund the police is about minimizing the role and power of police in our society. It's about demanding that the government stop writing blank checks for racist control, containment, and punishment. Defunding the police is also about recognizing that police do not solve or address any social issues. They do not prevent harm. What if we took that $100 billion and invested it in our community? What if we had housing, access to healthy food and clean water, health care, healing, cooperative businesses, education, child care, parks, art, and community services. If you already have those things, great. But that's not the reality everywhere. Ask yourself, if we have the resources, why doesn't everyone have this? Great, thank you. Um, you know, I think I, I was just thinking about the fact that people have a lot of opinions. Try to figure out ways to get people to see and understand um, very complex ideas. We have to use multiple ways of doing that, and some of it is obviously, you know, short videos. It's zines. It's art. Other of other kinds. It's writing op eds. It's doing all sorts of things. And what one really matters on the ground is the kind of direct you know, direct connections we have with people in our communities, the political education we engage in together, um, the ways we try to convince people to our case and to our side. Um, I spent over 20 years living in Chicago before moving back home to New York City in the summer of 2016. And in Chicago from 1972 to 1991, a group of police officers led by Commander John Burge systematically tortured over 118 Black people that could be documented. They did so with impunity for decades. Beginning in the mid 1980s, survivors of Burgess torture started to organize behind bars and their families began to organize on the outside. And it took years, like decades of litigation, agitation, investigative reporting, mobilizations and organizing for Burge to eventually be fired in 1993. He had joined the police department in, I think it was 
in like the 19, 1969 or 1970, I think, right when he came back from Vietnam. Um, many more years of organizing would then lead to his federal prosecution. People had been trying to get him to be prosecuted for torture. Eventually the feds came in and prosecuted him for lying about torture. He was convicted and sentenced to four years in prison. And what became clear through the years um, was the real inadequacy of traditional legal remedies to make individuals and communities whole systemic harm. Something else was needed. So recognizing the lack of redress for these systemic harms, Standish Willis, founder of Black People Against Police Torture and a renowned civil rights attorney in Chicago, made a call for reparations in 2008. In 2010, a group of artists, lawyers, torture survivors, families, organizers, and community members came together to form the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. CTJM amplified Stan's call by asking police torture survivors and the broader community to imagine how they would publicly memorialize these cases of torture, recognizing the difficulty and immensity of depicting the harms perpetrated, while also recognizing the struggle for justice waged by many over decades. Through art charrettes and teach-ins, creative outreach and community dialogue, CTJM sought to spark the collective imagination of communities to conceptualize what was necessary for the city to provide in order for individuals and communities to at least begin to heal from the torture that had occurred over those couple of decades. This call served to redirect everyone's attention beyond the usual cries for accountability for police violence that we hear all the time, indict, convict, send the killer cop to jail, the whole damn system is guilty as hell. And instead to focus on holistic means of meeting the material needs of members of impacted communities and offering positive visions for healing and repair. So in 2013, CTJM filed a reparations ordinance in the Chicago City Council with very little belief that it would ever pass. In 2015, after an intense Reparations Now campaign, Chicago became the first municipality in the United States to offer reparations to those violated by, by racist law enforcement. The reparations law represents the first time Chicago City Council had formally acknowledged and taken responsibility for the police torture that occurred and recognized its obligation to provide concrete redress to the survivors and family members. I think it's important to note um, as it relates to the reparations ordinance. And I think a lot of people who even know about this, most people don't know that it happened, but also those who do don't understand that there was no other way that the survivors who actually were a, under the reparations ordinance to be um, uh, part of the repair, there was no way they could sue the city. They, they had no more, like the statutes of limitations had run out on many of their cases. Um, and so like a reparations ordinance was the only possible way, a, a political solution rather than a legal solution was the only option remaining for the vast majority of the survivors who were still alive. Um, so what did we win through the Reparations Now campaign? In addition to the establishment of a $5.5 million reparations fund for Burge torture victims, the city is providing survivors and their families specialized counseling services at a new center, Chicago um, Torture Justice Center on the south side of Chicago. Um, uh, we won free enrollment in city colleges for all the survivors, their families, and their grandchildren. We won priority access to job training, housing, and other serv city services. Additionally, a history lesson about the Burge torture cases is now being taught in Chicago public schools for all eighth and 10th graders. And currently folks are insisting that the promised permanent public memorial that was promised in the reparations ordinance be erected to commemorate the torture, the survivors, and the resistance. 
we made a lot of art and we made a lot of new relationships through the successful abolitionist organizing campaign that was Reparations Now. So I'm gonna end with a video that my friend Tom Callahan and I made spotlighting the campaign a few years ago. So we'll start if we can just play that video. I believe in Chicago. I believe in peace. I believe in a brighter future. I believe in myself. I believe in my parents. I believe in education. I believe in life. We can make it. Our needs are basic. Peace and hugs. Wood and love blanket. More jobs. More education. Less prison. Less incarceration. More occupation. Less than and around this inside city. This shack town. To all my scholars, that's college down. I see your vision of young and profound. To all my street gangs, it's time to turn back. Let's switch lanes. Get on the right track. It's never too late to reach for the sky. All you need is courage and the will to fly. Get a half day for your back. It's the wall. We learn how to stand leap up from the fall. I just seen it all. Put the guns down, y'all. Write a new song because it's time to evolve. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. of Amisha Patel, um, who is one of the best organizers I know, based in Chicago. Many of us feel like we have to negotiate an unworkable system. Art making things is about unlocking what we can create, not just managing an unworkable system. Our creative power is at the center of our organizing for justice and liberation. Hope is creative hope. Um, plagiarizing Claudia Jones, who famously said that a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. I'm going to say that creativity and abolition are the genesis of our freedom. So let's stay creative. Let's abolish the PIC and let's get free. I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. Um, I just want to say, like, do two quick plugs. One is that, um, as Omar mentioned earlier, I've got a new book of my writing uh, essays and um, 
some interviews and talks uh, uh, coming in February. It's currently available for pre-ordering. It's called We Do This Till you Free Us. And I hope those who are interested will pick up a copy. Um, and then I put in a chat link to an ask off of one of our members of Survived and Punished New York um, is an incarcerated criminalized survivor named Janisha Brown. And Janisha's daughter, Sharon, just gave birth on Sunday, um, but is unable to care for her baby because Sharon struggles with mental illness, substance use issues, and currently lacks stable housing. So the hospital hasn't released Sharon's child to Janisha's family. Um, and they've been working urgently to try to keep Sharon's child out of foster care and to make one of Janisha's daughters, other daughters, the baby's legal guardian. Um, but they're really struggling right now to support Sharon financially and get her into some stable housing and winter clothes and things like that. So I've just put in the chat a link um, to supporting Sharon. We're trying to raise money right now to cover costs for that, um, you know, to get some housing for just baby and also to get some clothes and other things. If those of you who are um, able and, you know, want to like to contribute to that, I would invite you to please do so. And if you could share it with others in your communities, that would also be super helpful. Um, one of the most important ways that we can kind of chip away at this death making institution is to show care for each other as much as possible whenever we can. And aid is one of the important ways to do that. So I think you might join us in trying to raise this money for Sharon and her baby and her family. Um, Janisha would be very um, happy to know about that. So thank you all for that. And I'll pass on. I know we have questions coming. So Thank you all for listening. And for those of you who stay on for the questions, I am sure I'll have no good answers, but try. 